Bex, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Hello, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's fantastic to have you here on the show. Your article, 25 Pandas Functions That You Didn't Know or Probably Don't Know, I guess, as we'll yeah. see, that really caught my attention. Honestly, I don't know many of them, so I learned a bunch by watching it. You know, I do spend more time on the web side of Python and the data space ah. side of Python than I do on the data science, but certainly pandas is a, a super important part of, of Python these days. And I, honestly, the whole data science side is the fastest growing part of Python. Yes, yes. Yeah, pandas is like uh, one of the first libraries that you will be introduced in any beginner Python or in any beginner data science course. And uh, it's amazing how much it has grown since it's, uh, it was first la launched. And the funny thing about the article is that uh, before writing it, I also didn't know most of the functions. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd, I'll, I, would only, I would always get annoyed by people who use some uh, like uh, <laughs> complex functions. And I just uh, wanted to know how they worked and explain it to my audience. So uh, that was the idea of the article, uh, both me and the audience learning. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the little bit of secret behind these types of things, behind the tutorials, behind articles, behind podcasts, yeah. and even behind courses is a lot of times we dive into them because we're like, oh, I really want to learn these things and just let me, yes. you know, put it in a, a format I can present to the rest of the world and help everyone else out, right? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, articles, now, articles. Yeah, yeah, before yeah. we get into this, I want to talk about your articles and some Kaggle competitions, and, uh -huh. and then we'll dive into the 25 functions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's start with your story. How did you get into programming in Python? Yeah, uh, I right after I finished high school, I, uh, I got interested in web development. Uh, I learned some HTML and CSS, and uh, I was hoping to get things to get more, ex uh, to be more exciting. But uh, at some time, uh, I just got bored because... Uh, I'm really into math and web development had nothing to do with math, so uh, it was very boring. So I switched to learning Python, um, learned it after for a while and discovered that uh, data science is mostly uh, connected to math and statistics. So uh, just uh, I, so I just bought a really good course and uh, that's all it's how it started. Uh, yeah, I, that's I fantastic. You know, I think people do often feel like you have to be really good at math to be good at programming. And uh, honestly, yeah. most of programming has very little to do with math. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. But data science does. So data yeah. science is, is unique in this way. I mean, I guess computational science, right? If you're an yeah. astrophysicist, you do a lot of math as well. Uh -huh. But for most of us, Math is just a structured way of thinking and we have structured programs and that's kind of the end of the relationship there. But for yes. if, if someone is out there and they really love math and they want to take it farther, but they want to do that in computers, it sounds like recommending data science might be the right path. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, it's it's how it's very, really beautiful how uh, program like software and math connect together in data science and uh, what kind of uh, things it can achieve like for neural networks and like state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms. It's really amazing. Yeah. It's one of these areas that's just growing so fast and there's such big advancements. Yeah. You know, you look at, I, mean, I, I think back to when I was in college and we talked about artificial intelligence and AI and it was all about the, the Turing test, you know? Yeah. Uh. Could you get a, a chat bot that would trick a human into thinking that it was an actual other human? And uh, it yeah. never really seemed to come into reality. It always seemed like, oh, there's it's kind of always 30 years out. And then all of a sudden, we have self-driving cars and we have Google Copilot. And yeah, it's yeah. just the, the step jump over the last couple of years has been amazing. Yeah, I was also amazed by Google Copilot. Like right after it was uh, launched, I... I I wrote an article on it, like as a kind of intro, and it really took off. Like so many people were interested in it. Like it, it received like more than fifty thousand views. The article. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people were amazed by it. Absolutely, I I'm amazed by it as well. I think it's it is amazing. It's also bringing to light some interesting, almost legal and philosophical things. Right? If if people put code on GitHub. 
they didn't necessarily intend to train an AI with it. If they put code on GitHub that's under GPL, well, what the AI knows is that now GPL or is that completely, you know, can that be used in closed source? I, these are not known, right? These are, these are interesting questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think we're going to answer. We're not going to completely fill them out today. Yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah. let's focus on something more, a little smaller. Okay. So you mentioned your articles and yeah. you've been doing a lot of writing. So you're a top 10 writer in artificial intelligence on uh, yeah. yeah, Yeah. And you're also a Kaggle master. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about those two things for a little bit. Just give us a sense of the stuff that you write about on Medium and maybe some of your favorite articles before we dive into this yeah, one uh, that I picked out. I started writing on Medium uh, a year ago. Uh, it was just uh, purely for educational purposes. I really liked uh, how, uh, like, what uh, the things you learn will be, like, will be locked into your brain by writing about them. Hmm. Uh, so it was a really amazing way to learn something new. Uh, but uh, uh, as it... Uh, as my art, number of articles grew, uh, like my audience grew, and I met a lot of people, um, I had uh, I, it opened a lot of doors for me writing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, and the most of, most important of all, I am more confident about my knowledge than ever before. That's fantastic. I yeah. really like that you point out that it opened doors because yeah, yeah. So many people feel like. I'm not ready to write. I'm not ready to speak at a user group or a conference, or I'm not ready to appear on a podcast or any of these sorts of ways where you put yourself out there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. when you do that, the, the act of doing that pushes you to grow and it also opens doors to people. You know, if you're out there and you're genuine, it does, yeah. you don't have to be an absolute expert in everything. You just have to be excited and interested yeah. and other people who are excited want to talk to you and work on something with you. Right. Yes. Yes. You just have to be one step ahead of your audience and that's it uh, Right. when you write articles. That's right. And not necessarily in everything they know, just the little area that you're interested in, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, awesome. And so that's really great that you're doing this writing stuff. The other thing is uh, Kaggle. Tell us about what you've been doing at Kaggle. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I usually like, um, I really um, admire people who do, uh, who do like uh, do competitions on Kaggle for a while. Uh, and I really had this like imposter syndrome. I, I couldn't join the competitions because uh, I thought that they were, they were too complex, that I had like a lot of things to learn before I joined them. Uh, I still do, but uh, after I joined like uh, the tabular playground competitions, I, I learned that uh, I can do it. Yeah, so nice. uh, I started posting my articles in the form of notebooks on Kaggle as well. Uh, which started getting like uh, a lot of uh, a lot of views and really nice comments from the audience. And uh, you know, uh, the community on Kaggle is even more amazing than on Medium. Uh, for an article that gets like, like read by thousands of people on Medium, I I usually receive like one or two comments. But if you write if you post the same article as a notebook on Kaggle, uh, like the audience loves it because um, the Kaggle is mostly suited for this kind of tutorials and yeah I, I usually receive like 30 or 40 comments and that's really amazing as a writer to uh, to be part of that kind of community yeah that's really amazing i had no idea i didn't realize you could post on kaggle but yeah, i guess no, you kind of post your solutions and then have a conversation around them sort of right yes 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 okay awesome mm -hmm. people want to get started with kaggle you know what what do they need to do like maybe before we drop this topic like if people haven't done uh, stuff with Kaggle yet, but they maybe you want to use it to learn, what's your advice there? Yeah, I just after right after you create create an account, they have a, a whole suite of courses, free courses you can take. Uh, I think uh, those are the uh, those are very best, uh, very good starting points for any beginner. Uh, and also they have like uh, two or three beginner level competitions, so you don't get uh, you don't get intimidated by those grandmasters sure. or masters and they're just a simple a simple data sets you can work with and you just have to submit your predictions uh, and just get a score uh, and nothing too complex and that's really uh, the amazing part of Kaggle that's why those three competitions I have uh, I think they have like uh, 100,000 people competing at any single time in uh, in any time that's wild 
one of the challenges when you're learning is finding a structured problem to approach, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? In maybe in the web world, people try to build things that are too ambitious. They're like, oh, I want to build Airbnb. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't really hardly understand CSS. Let's take it down a notch and let's yeah. go slow and we'll get a right size problem for you to address. Data yeah. science has the same problem, but I think it has another aspect, which is, and you need the data to start yeah. from, right? Yeah, and I feel like Kaggle, Kaggle helps in, in bringing that kind of stuff over. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Kaggle like uh, has an amazing list of uh, data sets. Uh, I I I'm, I almost always use Kaggle data sets for my uh, for my articles because okay. most of them are uh, digestible and uh, small enough for people to get adva advantage of. Yeah, awesome. A question from the audience from Brandon Bennett says, asks: uh, Are Kaggle competitions just machine learning and artificial intelligence related, or are there other types? Ah uh, yeah, Kaggle competitions are only uh, AI or data science related. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, the latest uh, one launched in, on Kaggle, I think, is uh, about uh, finding the cuteness quotient of uh, pets. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, yeah, yeah. You just uh, you just take in like thousands of images and you process them with Python or R, and uh, and the, the neural network learns the structure and learns the, the cuteness quotient and just spits out a, a, a new quotient for any new image you get. That's amazing. So yeah. it used to be, you know, here, here's a machine learning model that can answer, is it a cat or a dog? And now it's giving you a cuteness score. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I, I can definitely see my daughter getting into data science with this one. Yeah, She's yeah. all about pets and, and cats and dogs. and. I personally want to put a vote out there uh, for the golden cocker, the golden um, retriever mixed with a cocker spaniel. Boy, those things are cute. <laughs> okay, so that's Kaggle. Sounds really great for learning. Yeah. And I suspect knowing something about pandas will pay off in, oh, yeah, in Kaggle of and stuff, right? Like it's such yeah. a foundational aspect. Yeah. yeah. yeah? Pandas so, are used excessively. Yeah, it is. And I feel like pandas is one of those things that you could learn it really quickly. You could learn to do stuff with pandas in a day. Yeah. yeah. But then in a year, you could still be learning stuff about pandas. <laughs> if you use yeah. it every day for a year, you know what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Most li data science libraries are just very vast. Uh, there are a lot of functionalities. And most of the time, like, you you can get around by learning like 10 or 15% of, of those functions. But uh, when you really need to get something like r really rare edge cases or unique cases, you really need to know uh, some of uh, those rare functions that are buried in the documentation just so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. In Python, we speak about Pythonic code. There's yeah. code that we could write that might be code that runs but it looks like it comes from java or it looks like it comes from c and somebody just yeah. got it working yeah, and yeah. i suspect you have the same thing in data science and around pandas yeah. it's like yeah you technically could do this with pandas but why don't you just call this function and probably yeah, the yeah. answer is well i didn't know that function existed of course i would have called it if yeah. i would known to do it but i just didn't yeah, yeah. know right i'm new yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so hopefully we can shine a light on some of those things that you can do i mean for example yes, hopefully. not that we'll necessarily cover it in your article but if you're doing a for loop with a yeah, data yeah. frame you're probably doing it wrong right yeah 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 the, the golden rule is to never use loops like each <laughs> loops completely yeah yeah that's pretty interesting it's uh definitely takes a different way of thinking sort of set based processing and and yeah. passing in expressions and lambdas to various places and, and whatnot yeah maps and whatnot okay we're going to talk about some of those mm -hmm. so let's let's dive in you know first of all how do you pick these 25 or these just 25 that you saw people use and they were interesting and you're like i didn't even know that existed or what was your philosophy here uh yeah uh for this kind of articles i usually go to the apr reference of the documentation uh it just lists every single class and functionality of some library the apr, APR reference and huh? i just uh read them one by one uh, decide uh, which uh, which one of those is going to be beneficial to me and possibly for my audience, and I just uh, pick them out yeah. one by one. 
Yeah, yeah that's really cool. I, I love to discover these types of things. So yeah. why don't you kick it off with number one? What, yeah. What's number one here? The first one is Excel Writer. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's a class for uh, writing to Excel sheets. So if you have multiple data frames, you can write to Excel sheets as uh, separate tabs with separate sheets. Uh, the pandas oh, has usually the data frames have this to Excel function, but uh, if you, if you give it a Excel writer instance, it's gonna write it to a separate sheet. Uh, it's gonna enable you to write to separate sheets. Yeah, this is super neat. So in your example here, which of course we'll link to the article and people can check mm -hmm. out, they all have a bunch of code mm -hmm. samples under each one of these. So you've got two data frames, yeah. two pandas data frames, and you want to put them into some kind of Excel spreadsheet. So you create one of yeah. these writers. This is the, the yes. function you're talking about. Uh -huh. And then you go to the data frame, you say to Excel, and you give it the writer and a sheet name. And you, give yes. it, you, you can do that for each data frame. You give it different sheet names, and it just piles yes. up along the bottom, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really yeah. neat. It's ridiculously simple, right? It's like, yeah. given the data frames, it's three lines of code. To create an Excel file this, and write it, yeah? Yeah, if you know this, you, you'd have to create two separate Excel files and just uh, add them together later manually, which is not yeah. programmatic, yeah. Right, or maybe you say you don't know that you can write to Excel. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure I could write to CSV. Ah, uh, yeah. And, and there's multiple levels, right? Like one level is like, I'm going to write it line by line, putting the yeah, commas yeah. in there myself. Uh, another one could be the write CSV, right? Read CSV, write CSV. Um, but this one is it like more structured, right? And then you could possibly yeah. use some of the more advanced tooling to do things like stylize or highlight aspects of mm -hmm. it or whatever, right? Like yeah. pie open Excel or something like that. Now for this one, you talk about, uh, it, it says that you need to have the right uh, supporting libraries there, right? You, for example, have to have uh, different libraries. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was uh, Pi, open, Pi Open, open Excel. Excel. Open, open Pi Excel. Excel. Yeah, that's it right here. Yeah, yeah. It was in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah Open yeah. Pi Excel if you want to work with XLS files. And there's yeah. other ones as well, right? Get, otherwise, you'll get an error. Yeah, right. So basically, Pandas delegates to this library, which actually understands Excel and writes yes, to it. Yes, yes. Yeah. Another one, I think it was this one. Uh, here is it this one yeah is, there's another one where it talks about using fs spec and uh -huh. this caught my attention as like oh wow this is way more flexible because i'm not sure people are aware of what fs spec is are, are you familiar with fs spec no no so fs spec is this library that allows you to treat different destinations as Python file systems. Like, you know, with open some file name, instead of file name, you can do all sorts of stuff. So uh, let me see if I can find uh, some of the, the documentation here of the things that it can go to. Mm -hmm. uh, it integrates with a bunch of different places, but I'm not sure which, which one it goes to. But it goes to places like S3 storage and FTP and database uh, and, and zip yeah. files and all of these types of crazy things. And it even yeah, does yeah. caching against those, right? So this Excel writer, mm. while it already sounds really interesting because it writes to Excel, like destination of these Excel files, like this could be an Excel file in a database or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With basically oh, yeah. hardly any changes to the code. Yes, yes. Yeah, that would that's. Be cool. Yeah, that's super cool. So good one to kick it off there. A lot going on. The next one is pipe, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the image that's also. <laughs> yeah, there's like yeah. a yeah. lumberjack looking dude smoking pipe. Yeah, that's that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about pipe. Yeah. So uh, when you do data analysis, like most of the time, the data you'll be dealing with will be like uh, not clean. You have to perform some operations. Uh, and Pipe really offers a way to just just, just package those uh, all those operations into a single uh, line of code or, or into a single code of blo block block of code. It's kind of like it, it's going to like scale learn pipelines, or you, you just have to run uh, as only single line of code and just uh, it just performs several operations at the same time. 
it's really just a neat way to, to do data cleaning. Right. And it's what's called a fluent API. So if I call dataframe.pipe, what comes back is another data frame. And then I could call yes. dot pipe on it again and then dot pipe yes. and dot pipe and chain those together. Yes. Applying different operations and transformations. It's almost like um a map producer aggregation framework type of thing here, right? It's pretty yeah. flexible, I would think. It's just uh, like pandas in all in all its entirety. Like uh, the amazing one of the amazing features of pandas, like consistency, consistency, consistency. Always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like it. It looks super neat. So, if you need to do transformations on a data frame with custom mm -hmm. functions and, and get answers out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you pointed out here is that. As part of this, you know, you could apply it to the whole data frame or you could pass a set of columns yes, as yes. part of it. So right, as what you're piping across, what does that do? That reduces the result to just those, if you pass in three things, just those three columns. Uh, uh, these, you, uh, uh, yeah, these two functions remove outliers and encode categoricals are, uh, are functions that accept arguments. And when you pass it to pipe, you just have to pass the, the function name. Got it. Uh, which means you can pass the arguments. So uh, uh, to, uh, to pass the arguments, actually, you just have to uh, provide them after the comma. Uh, so uh, this remove outliers function just accepts one argument as a list, and it performs like outlier removal and just returns the Got whole it. data frame. I see. So you can pass, like, your function might take the data frame, but it might also take additional information. Like, I want yeah. to exclude things that are over $100 and just throw them away. Well, yeah, you've got yeah. to pass that 100 in because it needs yeah, to know 100 yeah. versus some other cutoff value, right? Got yes, it. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. And you say it resembles scikit-learn pipelines, pipelines, which is, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, we're up to number three, factorize. Yeah. Tell us so, about this one. Uh, in machine learning, as you know, uh, uh, algorithms, algorithms only accept numerical data. And uh, most real-world data sets contain categoricals, which means like uh, there are like uh, class one, class two, or class three, and you have to encode them like uh, to um, to numeric like zero, one, two, three, or uh, using like one hat encoder or label encoder in scikit-learn. But uh, you can do it uh, in pandas as well. You just have to uh, pass the column to factorize, and it just uh, encodes them with numericals for each class. I see. So let me see if I can give an, an audio-friendly audio example for listeners here. Yeah. If we've got something that says a uh, data frame where one of the pieces is what the weather was, like sunny, rainy, r sun, rain, snow, clouds, something like that, you can't feed sun <laughs> to the machine learning model. you got to give yeah. it a number, right? Yes. So this will convert that to like zero for sun, and everywhere sun appeared, you would now have a zero one yeah. for rain everywhere there's a rain and so on so it just does that figures out how many different categories there are and then a, gives them a number that can be sent yeah. off to machine learning right yes yes you explained it better <laughs> <laughs> awesome see i'm learning right i'm just uh yeah. i'm just following along with you here awesome okay that's a really cool one this next one uh seems a little bit crazy but it looks very yeah. useful <laughs> explode yeah. right what is explode, explode yes yeah, uh, as you know, like survey data, uh, surveys usually contain questions that are multiple choice. You can just uh, pick uh, a lot of uh, like uh, more than one answer to one question, uh, and that's recorded as one answer. So uh, you, you're just going to end up with these kind of uh, lists in a single cell of the table, like uh, a question uh, if you have a question one and, and the user just picks uh, the answers A, B, C, it's going to end up, uh, A, B, C is going to end up as a list in a single cell of a table. Right. So, so for an example, here you have a series that has one yeah. and then six and then seven. And then the fourth element is a list of three yeah. other numbers. And you're like, wait a minute, those are not supposed to just be yeah. multidimensional. Yeah. I want a straight series, right? Yes, yes. You, you want a straight series. And when you call explode on this series, it's going to just uh, expand the series vertically and just uh, going to fill up, uh, just takes the elements of this uh, single cell lists and just expands them uh, vertically. Okay. 
Yeah. And these are the types of things that you were talking about with loops, right? Like it would be yeah, really yeah. easy to go through and say, I'm going to build up a new data frame. And if I see a list instead of a number, I'm going to just start appending those from the list with an inner loop and then we'll carry on. Right. And here you've literally done it in one line. Yeah. Yeah. This would be crazy complex if you did it like manually. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And honestly, slower, right? Because a lot of this yeah, is yeah. probably implemented in C, whereas yeah. you would be doing it at the Python layer. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be very slow. All right. Uh, another question from Brandon out there. Glad he's here in the live stream. Uh, how would I apply explode to the entire data frame? I'm I, guessing I he's know. thinking about maybe if you had multiple columns and they each potentially had this. I don't think that's possible. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Pandas allows that. Yeah. Okay. So it's got to be on a, a series, not on yeah. a, a data well, frame. Simple. Right. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Cool. So these all <laughs> these all have fun names that stand out. The yeah. Next yeah. One, very right? very fun names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you pick some cool pictures, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So what's the next one? Squeeze. Squeeze. Uh, yeah. Uh, as you can see, like there are some uh, conditional operators uh, return uh, like real uh, like. Uh, data frames, even if it's a single cell, like as you can see this uh, from the subset set, uh, we are just asking the, the diamonds data frame to return all diamonds that are priced below one dollars, and just return and it just returns a single result, which is uh, three hundred twenty six, and uh, but it's returned as a data frame, which is uh, not comfortable to work with, like a single cell data frame. You right, because want Panda doesn't know ahead of time that a dot yeah. lock call is going to result in a single item. This yeah, happens yeah. a lot in databases too. You do a query and, and the result is actually a single thing, but yeah. the, the framework has no way to know that you, the data is structured in a way that's unique or that's a one thing. And yeah. I suspect that's common here with data frames as well. You're, yeah. you're structured, yeah. like I know this is going to give me the one answer. Yeah, yeah, but, but it just returns the whole table. Yeah, yeah, you're like, God, oh, well, now I got to like dig in and say, yeah, yeah. Know, first row, yeah, first yeah. column. Yeah, okay. So squeeze yeah. helps fix this? Yeah, just you just call this uh, like, oh, squeeze on a single cell data frame or series, and just it removes all the dimensional dimensionality and just returns the number. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. What happens if I call it on one that's got more than one item? Do you know? Does it just give you the first or does it freak out and let you know? Yeah, I, I think I never tried that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never tried that. Yeah, don't do that, right? It's like, uh, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. I mean, maybe if you just actually want the first answer, maybe it's okay, but it also might yeah. give you an exception. It might be fun, I don't know. Might be fun yeah. to try it out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cool. So the next one has to do with finding things in a range, right? Yeah, between, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, like, just the name suggests, like, you want to, uh, take all the rows that are between in between some range. For example, here in the code example, uh, I'm choosing uh, all diamonds that are priced between $3,500 and $3,700. Nice. So, of course, you could do this probably as an expression. Yeah. You could definitely do this as a loop. Yeah, yeah. But both of those are, are slower, I'm sure, because yeah, they're not implemented internally, right? Yeah, less elegant. This one is better and faster yeah. and uh, shorter. Yeah, and one of the things, the third parameter you can pass here to between, in addition to like the lower bound and upper bound, is whether yeah. or not it, it includes the endpoints, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, this yeah. one is uh, inclusive is neither, so uh, it's like uh, open set. Nice. Another thing that I've seen here, which is not one of your 25, but looks nice, I'm used to, visualizing quickly visualizing a data a data frame when i get it back with head or tail and i want to know like okay kind of what did i get back here well, show me yeah. the front that'll be good do ahead or uh, let's go to the end and see what happened at the end but here you have dot sample that's interesting yeah uh, i usually uh, i i use it often because uh some data sets have like ordering uh, uh for example time series data sets and uh, the first few rows might be not too representative of the whole data frame. So uh, I just call sample with like uh, five or 10 rows uh, and that, uh, that randomly samples the data set. And I, usually sometimes that shows the, uh, that represents the data set better than head or tail. Right, exactly. It's, and so it just kind of randomly picks some stuff throughout the data set to show you yeah. what's going on, right? For yeah. large data sets, that's really handy. Uh, nice yeah. to know. Uh, so the next one has to do with, 
I'm guessing yeah. like when you're doing matrix multiplication and yeah. vectors and like true, truly doing math, most of the time I would expect this to show up. Yeah. The, most of the time, capital yes. T. Yeah. Transpose. Yeah. Yeah. It stands for transpose. Uh, I usually, uh, you, you usually don't do math or matrix multiplication in pandas. Uh, you will do it in NumPy, but uh, this one I use it mostly for uh, when you uh, on the result of describe. You see here, uh, describe it. returns uh, the axis inverted, so uh, the five number summary is uh, given as rows, uh, and that's really a problem when you have multiple columns because. Uh, the data set starts to expand horizontally, uh, which which makes you, you scroll to uh, to the right, which you don't right. want. So when you do describe, you get things like given a data set, it'll say, here's the count of this index, the mean of this index, or yeah. uh, or this this call uh, this value of a column, uh, yeah. standard deviation, and so on, and and the number of options there is unbounded, but. The fact that it goes count means standard deviation minimum and then a few more things that's fixed and that fits pretty well. Yeah. So you're saying if you transpose or like flip the rows and columns so that you yeah. make it go vertical instead of across, that's an easier yeah. way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah. And it's as easy as saying dot T. So it's, yeah, it's not yeah. too hard to do, right? You might as well. Yeah, it's it's an attribute. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, that's that's a really good one. So you're saying if, if I'm going to do like some kind of matrix multiplication stuff, I should not do it in pandas. I should just stick to NumPy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NumPy is like purely for mathematical purposes. And it's it's much faster than pandas. Yeah. I suspect that NumPy has a good transpose as well. But Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it has the same attribute. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of synergy between those two libraries. So yeah. the next one has to do with styling things and how they look right one of the things that's cool about pandas is it mixes well with jupyter notebooks and yeah. jupyter notebooks have a nice sort of explore the data and let's see what's going on let me just look at it right so this styler thing that yeah. style attribute helps here, you with like, that right yeah here like uh, it, it takes advantage of that uh, the fact that jupyter uses uh, html and css under the hood Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you can you can take advantage of that and use some HTML and CSS knowledge to style your data frame based on some like Pythonic loops or conditionals. Here, uh, for example, after you take the transpose or the describe, you can just uh, st uh, highlight the, the maximums of each row or column using uh, the highlight max function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pandas offers a lot of functions uh, after the style attribute. You can just uh, you can uh, use the built-in functions, or you can uh, come up with some uh, custom logic to style your data frame using HTML and CSS. Okay. Yeah, this is great. So you can say, for example, here dot style dot highlight max, and then you yeah. give it some CSS values like color or dark red or something like that, yeah. right? Yeah. It, uh, yeah. So like you just don't have to look at the raw numbers. It just uh, shows you uh, the most important metrics or, or the ones that you want. It's really useful when you have like multiple columns. You just don't want to have to, you just don't want to look at all those crazy numbers and you yeah. just use some. Well, yeah, yeah, like a real, so, a real reasonable or maybe straightforward thing you might start out by doing. So, well, let me just sort it. We'll sort it so the highest one's at the top. But in this example, you've got multiple columns and yeah. the... the the max of one column is in one value, but it, it's a different row for a yeah. different attribute of it, right? Yeah, and so yeah. sorting it is going to do nothing except for like yeah. if you come up with a whole bunch of variations and try to look at it and a, a little bit of color, a little bit of picture goes a long ways. Yeah, yeah. Visual. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the second example you have here in your article is a little yeah, more nuanced. Is, this looks great. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, this one is like background gradients. So... Uh, it just colors uh, each cell of the of the of the column based on the on its magnitude. It's kind of like a cube helix palette. Like it's kind of like continuous palette. It just shows uh, wh where the maximum or the minimums are and uh, just how they compare to each other. Yeah, it's almost like if you could do a heat map yeah. in an Excel That's table, you know, yeah, by yeah, making yeah. the cells different colors. 
yeah. right? You can pass in a color map and, and all sorts of stuff to control how that looks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. I like it. That's this is great. You know, it's one of these things where again, one line of code and you can dramatically improve the presentation value or the informational yes. value of what you're looking at, right? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. And I feel like that's similar to your number nine. Yeah, this one is panel options. Uh like it's kind of settings of your phone. Uh, you just set them globally and it applies to all the data frames, the series and all the functions that you are going to be using uh, inside the project uh, or inside the session of Jupyter Notebook. Yeah. So if you want to have some sort of uh, number of columns that are shown or some kind yeah. of color or something like that, you can just set that up at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. You, you just don't have to call them every single time or change them every single time. It's just a, a shorthand of way of doing same things like uh, setting global settings. Yeah, you could probably even do something like have a little JSON file that describes the look and feel of what you're doing. You know, yeah, just your first line, just load it up and set it, and then yeah. you know go go from there. Something to that effect, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't have to completely fill your the first few lines of your notebook with like setup code. Yeah, for example, one of those examples is like. Uh, uh, display max uh, max rows. If you set it to five uh, and you just uh, uh, call the data frame, it's gonna only show the first five rows. So you don't have to call dot hat every time. Oh, I see. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, because yeah. of course, it's if there's enough rows, it won't print the whole thing out, right? Probably. Yeah. 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 You don't want to print ten million rows and completely yeah. lock up the system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's gonna. Uh, Cool. Oh, and another one that's kind of nice is display precision. And oh, yeah, if you yeah. set that, you won't see the, you know, 1.27e to the five or whatever, yeah, right? It's, can... it's really annoying you know, when, you, when you're working with uh, like uh, math functions. It, it just uh, keeps giving in like scientific notation when you, when you just want to like uh, see the first or four or five decimal places. Yeah, scientific notation is great when you're dealing with huge numbers or tremendously yeah. small numbers, right? Like yeah, yeah. how many meters across is an atom? Okay, so you're gonna need a E to something. But for human beings, often, you know, you wanna just look at the number and go, yeah, that's a million, not like, you know, yeah. 1.2 E to the six or seven, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's gonna be really annoying. That's cool. Uh, and this is just one of those options you can set up and it just yeah. globally applies to that notebook. Yeah, yeah. So another thing that's interesting about pandas is the columns have types. Yeah. Usually, but not always. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those like uh, beginning level things uh, that you, you'll encounter, but uh, it can get really annoying if the data types are incorrect for your column. Uh, the most important one is the object data type. Uh, right, that's like, I don't really know, so we're just going to store it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, uh, I'm just going to yeah. put it inside of an object, and uh, objects are like, uh, object data type is the worst one. Uh, it also limits the functionality of pandas, and it's the, also the most memory consuming. Right, so the next function, what number are we yeah. on here? Number 10. And yes, in the hit list is convert underscore D types as in convert data types. Yeah, it just uh, when you call it on the whole data frame, it just infer, it tries to infer uh, the correct data type for each column. Uh, it's either it's if it's a float or integer or string like that. Yeah. So your example, you're reading a CSV file yeah. and some of the columns are detected correctly like floats but others get this object but after calling convert yeah. d types it's like you know what no those are strings yeah yeah, yeah but cool. it can't handle uh the date date times because uh there are so many date time formats and pandas can't possibly <laughs> know all of them why are date times so hard yeah. they really shouldn't be but they really are it's crazy yes. and yeah. then you throw in time zones and you'll forget it yeah, okay, yeah. and throw in t daylight savings and all these other things. Oh, yeah, 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 that, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, daylight saving is crazy. Yeah, I suspect some of the Kaggle stuff, You part of the challenge is like normalize these dates because who knows or, or something. Yeah, yeah. Lines, yeah, time zones are like total mess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So related yeah. to converting the data types is to select, select them. them. Yeah, yeah, which is a, a way to filter 
what's yeah. in there. Like you can filter by column or, or rows or even a condition, but this is saying like, I only want the strings or I only want the numbers, right? Yeah. Uh, you went while doing machine learning, uh, you have to uh, apply certain preprocessing functions to only a subset of the data ram, like only on categoricals or only numerics. So uh, this function will become very handy. You just want to you just you just pass the data type uh, as a uh, using NumPy, and it just uh, gives all the, the the subset of the data frame with that data type. Nice. So you would say like data frame dot select data types and then include equals np number and now yeah. instantly the resulting data frame is a subset that only has numbers right yes that's cool and then also you point out that you can do the reverse just like give you yeah. just uh the other yeah. like just the informational bits uh, yeah. like categories and stuff or yeah, yeah. yeah 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 cool by saying exclude yeah very nice. Okay, well, we just missed it with uh, Halloween here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mask. <laughs> but mask. You know, you've got yeah. a, a cool picture of like a, a mask here. But mask is number 12. 12. That's about yeah. it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a conditional. Uh, on uh, You can use it on, uh, on series or data frames. And it just returns uh, the subset of, uh, the data, of the data where some condition is true. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, in this example here, you've got a bunch of ages. Yeah. And, and I want to subset them using uh, between. Uh, I want to take all those uh, uh, rows that are beyond sixty or below fifty and convert those values to NAN. Got it. Okay. So this is like an in place update, or I guess it replaces, uh, creates another one that would is like as if you updated it, and it yeah. finds all the stuff that's. I guess outside of your range and yes. then it applies this other value, right? Like if it's stuff that's outside of this range, in this case, yeah. you're going to set it to not a number, but it could be set yes. to zero or, or max anything or yeah. yeah, anything. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, a very good one. Similar, I guess is min and max. And then some of these, as we get a little farther down your recommendations, I like them. They're not just, Oh, here you can apply this function, but apply it in this scenario or this context to get an interesting outcome, right? So that's what number yeah. 13 is like, min yeah. and max along columns axis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, usually uh, when you call min on max uh, on a column, it just returns uh, the minimum or maximum of that column. But sometimes you you want it to row wise, like uh, it just treats uh, rows as columns and it gives uh, min and max across the rows. That's usually uh, useful and a handy way of doing something that would take uh, a lot of code if you're done manually. Yeah, I, another one of these tricks that or techniques yeah. that lets you avoid looping, right? Yeah, uh, I, here I show a good example of like uh, comparing four different libraries on five data sets. And uh, you, want, uh, you want the best performance on each data set. So you have to find the, the best score across the rows. Right, exactly. So the yeah. the columns are the different libraries like XGBoost, CatBoost, Scikit-Learn, yeah. and so on being applied to the same data set. And you want to just go for row one, what one did the best? Row two, what one did the best? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very it nice. It takes a lot of code if done manually. Yeah, cool. All right. Number 14, in largest and in smallest. Yeah, we're talking about those uh, max or minimums. minimums. Uh, so, and largest, uh, when you give, when you pass a number and a column name, uh, it just returns the data frame that contains uh, the smallest or largest n uh, rows of that uh, column. Nice. So, if I were to call min or max, that would give me the smallest or the largest one, respectively, yeah. right? Yes. But a really interesting or common question you might have is like, what are the top 10 selling products <laughs> this yeah. month, right? Yeah. And this lets you just say n largest 10, and then you yeah. pick the column on which to judge it. Here you have price, right? Yeah, yeah, five most expensive diamonds in the diamonds data set. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, one of these things that, you know, no more looping or any of that stuff, or no more if statements, yeah. just just call it, right? Yeah, this one is like the, the five cheapest, most cheapest diamonds. Hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, 
Yeah. So in smallest and largest, fantastic. Also, sometimes when you're asking for a minimum or maximum thing, you don't actually want the minimum or maximum. You want to know where that is because you're going to get that thing yeah. back and say, I need that whole row because I yeah, want to yeah. learn more information about it. Right. But if you said, yeah. well, what's the minimum price? It's seven. Like, oh, OK, great. Now do I need to like loop through until okay. I find the thing that has seven yeah, yeah. or right? something like this? Yeah. So you've got a recommendation for that. Yeah. Yeah, the IDX man is IDX min. Uh, just returns the index values of minimum, minimum or max, so that you can uh, look at the the row that they are stored at or the the column. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So here here is the row that contains the minimum yeah. price. I, I love it. Yeah. Really nice. All right. So so many of these are really easy to apply, right? Like it's not yeah. it's not a lot of research to learn how to apply ID max yeah but at the same time or idx max but at the same time knowing that it exists now all of a sudden you can use it really easily but you yeah. probably wouldn't have known to look for it right yeah yeah cool uh, you know uh, people often talk about differences between beginner developers and expert developers and i think a lot of times beginners look at folks like you who have a lot of experience are like all oh, this this guy is so incredibly smart and he just has this way of solving these problems that's so amazing and you know to some degree that's probably true but a lot of it is like just building up layers and layers of these like oh i know i can use id uh, id max idx max i know that i can use n largest and you just sort of pile them together and then like yeah. bam like the solution becomes easier because you have these little building blocks right so it's I think this is really valuable for people. Yeah, to pay. I usually uh, I usually think that uh, the biggest difference between a beginner level and a more experienced programmer is just is like uh, just how much time they spend on the documentation. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you read the docs, like if you patiently read the docs, you you're just gonna become really a really good uh, user of that particular tool or library. I agree. There's just more. You understand it better you know more of what it has to offer so it's yeah. you know, like it's less you've got to reinvent yeah all right this this i talked about how you have something that may be well known but then applying it in a scenario and this number 16 is value counts with drop in a false what's this one about yeah can you hear me yeah, sorry. I think it cut out just for a second there. Uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah, tell us about this number sixteen one here. Yeah, uh, when you well, when you have a series uh, uh, with uh, like categoricals, you just want to see the their proportions or their numbers as a whole in the total series, and that usually doesn't include uh, the null values. So uh, you have to call is null and uh, and chain it with sum so that you, you get a you get the you you learn the number of nads in that column. Uh, but uh, you can do it efficiently with value counts with setting by setting drop NA to false, uh, which includes uh, the proportions of the null values as well. Nice. Yeah, so it just gives you a, basically a percentage as a ratio here. It's just yeah. a ratio yeah. <laughs> of the number of the different uh, categories that have appeared here, right? So very cool. And now just not a number is included. That's great. Yeah, then you can decide. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, number 17, clip. This is a good one. Clip, yeah. Yeah, yeah for, clip is good. Yeah, for data that exceeds, I don't know, maybe a range, maybe it's supposed, some instrument's supposed to collect zero to 100 and it <laughs> goes yeah. crazy and it goes outside of 100. Yeah, for example, Tell us about uh, clip. here we go back to the ages example uh, where I just want to have. Uh, ages between uh, like 18 or 60, 18 and 60. And I want to exclude all those values. Uh, and when you call clip with those custom values, it's just going to uh, impose those hard limits on the whole series. Right. So it'll replace the ones that are over with the maximum that you set and the ones that are too low, it'll bring them up to the minimum, right? Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Again, against the whole data set, not looping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Only at uh, one column at a time. Yeah. We talked about how difficult time is, but you do have some recommendations for yeah, yeah. doing searching for data that appears at a certain time or in a time range, right? Yeah. What, what's number 18? 
Yeah, this one is like a subsetting of uh, a rows of the data frame uh, at some uh, particular time of the day, like any time of the day, but uh, uh, you know, like for example, three o'clock, uh, 9.30, 10.30, or any time that you want. You're just gonna uh, take all those rows and return them using at time. Yeah, that's super easy, right? Just pass yeah. in at time and you literally specify Time, yeah, yeah, right? like just fifteen like, like, colon zero yeah. zero as a string. Just like yeah. in like uh, in like real conversation or uh, messaging. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, which is, is also time. interesting, is between time, right? Like what happened in the morning, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what? Well, uh, what are those uh, sales that happened in the morning or uh, after midnight or during some particular interval? Uh, this one is really handy to do that. Yeah, so super easy. Just data frame dot between time, or is that yeah. a series? Yeah, no, no, no. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't nice. matter. Uh, it, it usually has to be. Uh, it, it it has to have a daytime index. That's it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So then you just pass in strings like nine colon forty five to twelve colon zero zero, and you know that's like late morning or something. Beautiful. Yeah. The next one here has to do with time series number nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Again, time series. date range. Tell us about this. Uh, well, this one is like stands for uh, business date range. Business date range. So, uh, like pandas uh, inter internally built in, like built into uh, calendars. Like uh, it just uh, when you want to. Uh, how can I say? <laughs> uh, when you want to index the data frame you want, uh, time series data frame. Uh, you want to include only like uh, working days, like you want to exclude all the weekdays, weekends. Yeah. And you can do that for every single of the year or for every single week of the year because you can possibly, possibly know which days are weekends. So uh, when you call uh, B date range, it just uh, takes, uh, it just index the data, indexes the data, 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 data frame using only uh, uh, week weekdays. And also yeah. it excludes uh, the holidays, I think. Oh my gosh. I was just wondering about holidays. Like there's another yeah, yeah. wrinkle in there. Yeah, yeah. But already things like leap year and stuff yeah. like that is, is built into this, I would imagine. So this is super yeah. cool. Yeah, this is very important for when you are doing time series forecasting or uh, financial analysis mm -hmm. because uh, like, uh, or working with stocks because uh, stocks are only traded on week weekdays and not on holidays. So right. it will be very important. Or even if you do in like traffic analysis, you want to tr understand accidents that are a result of rush hour, right? You wouldn't yeah. want to look on a weekend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The next one has to do with correlation. Auto core, C O R R. Yeah. Yeah. Auto correlation. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't do much with time series. So you're going to have to tell us about this one. What's going on here? Uh, yeah. For example, uh, this is usually how uh, it's. Uh, the autocorrelation of a series or time series tells uh, the predictability of the time series with itself. Uh, it's. Uh, do you know about correlation coefficient? Yeah, exactly. It tells you how much the model yeah. matches the actual data. Like it's 97% likely that the model will predict the, the stuff coming yeah, up. Yeah. Right? Uh, it could be linear or more complicated, but that's something like that, yeah? Yeah, the gist of this is that uh, if, uh, if a time series has a, uh, high autocorrelation with itself, it means uh, you can predict it more easily. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, it's uh, how and basically how predictable or unpredictable is this yeah, thing? Uh, yeah, there there is a lot of details uh, about autocorrelation, and it's it has very uh, it has very many applications in time series. Uh, but the gist is that like uh, it, it shows you how much predictability it has, like at each uh, interval. Nice, cool. It sounds very useful if you're doing that kind of stuff. All yeah. right. Number 21, has NANs. Yeah, it, it's an, it's also an attribute. Uh, you just call it on a series and it uh, returns true or false. If you have, it, it returns true if you have at least one missing value in a series. Yeah, so there was this quote, I can't remember who it's attributed to, sorry, that uh, says something to the effect of, uh, like data cleanup and data wrangling is not the dirty work. It is the work of data science, like to get everything ready. And then you just like hit it with the magic yeah. at the end. Right. And yeah, this yeah. feels like that lands right in that realm is like given some data frame or series, 
does it have not in numbers or is it all good? Yeah, yeah. Missing values is like a huge problem in machine learning. Uh, most uh, scikit-learn algorithms don't accept missing values. So you, you either have to drop them or impute them some using some techniques. And this one is uh, very handy to, to, de to, de to detect those missing values. Right. I suspect this is the first test. Like if it has not in numbers and then yeah, we're yeah. going to go do stuff. But if, if it says false, then you're good to go. Just roll. Right? Yeah, Just yeah. Go with that. But uh, it usually uh, turns true. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Are you familiar with the, um, the missing no? Let me. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, another thing that I was sort of came to mind is like this yeah. whole thing, this missing no package as in yeah. um, like no numbers. So a way to not just answer yes or no, but to get visualizations. Have you used this? Yeah, yeah. I also wrote an article on it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, so definitely. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Things like this sound really useful to me. They seem yeah, like I really like that missingness mat matrix. It mm -hmm. just shows uh, the reasons why uh, missing values are correlated, how missing values are correlated with other columns. Right. Is it a whole bunch of missing data in one row? Yeah. And then it's all good? Or is it interspersed? Like this one's missing the birthday, but that one's missing the name or something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. It's, it's a really good package. Yeah, fantastic. All right. At number 22, at and I at. Uh, yeah, this one is like uh, a faster versions of lock and I lock. Uh, it just uh, uses it just enables you to uh, index your data frame. Uh, but this one is specifically designed for uh, retrieving single value conditionals. Nice. It's uh, almost like an array index. Yeah. A little yeah. bit. What's Before the difference between at and I at? Uh, at uh, uh, using at you can use like column labels like uh, as you can see here we are using cut and an index uh, but I add you have to know the index of that column I see so with add it would be like row and then column name where I add is row and column number yeah. so it's In it's probably less flexible you got to know that cut is four because it could be moved yeah. around as people are creating yeah. or inserting data yeah, got yeah. it yeah yeah nice Okay, uh, ag sort as in arg aggregation, sort. yeah? Yeah. Arg, uh, no, 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 arg sort, sorry, misreading, arg sort. Yeah, uh, this one uh, just uh, returns the indices that would sort a data frame. Okay. Based on some column. So uh, uh, in during data analysis, uh, you sometimes want the indices, not the actual sorted data, so that you can use those indices in uh, multiple times over. Uh, Got it, so you get the sorted say I want to sort by the total bill, yeah. um, but then give me the indexes as if it was sorted, but don't actually change it. So then you could go and then yeah. request data yeah. off those indexes. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Nice. All right, we're closing in on the end, and we've brought in the cat, the cat accessor. Yeah. Cat accessor. Yeah, I should have put an image here. <laughs> yeah, there, there would have been uh, some kind of cool cat you could put in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, as you know, like pandas enables you to perform some like data type specific functions. Like uh, there is DT accessor for date time, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, uh, and also STR for strings. And this one is for strictly for categorical purposes. Uh, you just uh, it uh, it has uh, like a large suite of uh, categorical functions uh, that makes it easier to work on uh, categories, ordinals, or nominal data. Okay. Yeah, fantastic. And let's bring it to the 25th with uh, nth, group by nth. Yeah, this one is le yeah, less useful, used very in very rare edge cases. Uh, when you group by by some column, or a, possibly a categorical column, uh, you, you want to look at those rows or, or groups, right? And calling nth on 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 the grouped data frame, just returns that uh, nth row or col uh, nth row of that groups of each group. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that looks really cool. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for our list. Hopefully, people out there listening have definitely learned something. Now, yeah. your title was just to put a little disclaimer in here for everyone: it's twenty-five panda functions you didn't know existed. Pipe yeah, p yeah. guarantee equals 0.8. So you you had this 80 percent yeah likelihood. I, I love it. That's a little bit of a stats. Yeah, yeah. Uh, joke no one complained about that, so uh, I think that was right. Yeah, 
It sounds about right. It seems like there's a lot of neat use cases here that people can find. Yeah. So, you know, this is, these are your 25 that you found interesting. Other people might find them as well, but yeah, yeah. You know, these there are, are so the kind of, options. oh, so many. Yeah. 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 These are the types of things though, that people can say, all right, today I'm going to try to work with number one as I'm doing yeah. my data analysis and stuff. I just, uh, I know I'm going to be doing some Excel stuff. So let's do the Excel writer one. And then, you know, maybe later it's like, oh, I know I'm doing survey type of data. So let me work with explode and yeah. just try to, you know, if you work these in one at a time, eventually they become part of your tool chest and yeah, yeah. they're good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And just expanding your tool set and skills. Yeah, I think so. I think part of the trick is to make sure that you apply it a little bit. Right. Uh, I mean, you yeah. know, they're out there, but just, as you use them, like bring them in. Yeah. It just yeah. saves you time and resources. Awesome. Yeah. Half the battle is just knowing that it exists, right? It's not that yeah, it's yeah, necessarily yeah. hard to use. It's like, I just didn't know this was even an option. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Really, these, all of these are very easy to use. You just know that they exist. Yeah. I feel like so much of pandas is that way, but they're so, it's hard to know because there's so much to do there. Um, it's cool. Yeah. Uh, out the live stream, Brandon, just wanted, now we're kind of done. I wanted to throw out a, he said, very helpful. Thank you for the article, Bex. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thanks for doing this one. I do yeah. want to point out, we certainly don't have time to cover it, but let me pull it up here so I can make sure it goes in the links as well. You did the same thing for NumPy, right? Yeah, and you also I, were I, a little more calm. I got to say, you're a little more confident here. Your P of guarantee equals 0.85 instead of 0.8. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, NumPy, uh, NumPy functions are a little bit harder to understand. Uh, that's why uh, most of them don't bother to learn those, most people. So I was a bit confident because I also didn't know most of these functions. That's why I was a bit more confident. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. All right, so if people like this flow and they want to kind of go a little deeper and go into the NumPy layer, they can check that out. They can also check out a bunch of your other writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I so also have the same for SKLR. Okay, right on for uh, scaling. Great. All right, anything else you want to add to this article before we call it uh, good on that topic? No, no, I think we covered everything. Yeah, we covered it well. I think it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. All right, now before you get out of here, there's the two questions you've got to answer. If okay. you're going to write some Python code, what editor do you use? What are you going to use? Uh, for data analysis, I usually use JupyterLab. Uh, yep. But if I have to do pure Python, that's always uh, PyCharm. I love it. Yeah, awesome. That's a good combo. Yeah. And then notable PyPI package. Something doesn't have to be something super popular, but something that you ran across that people are like, you, you're like, I people should know about this. You, this is something I learned about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Got it. One you want to suggest for us? Uh, any any package? Uh, my favorite package? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, well, uh, I've recently come across with UMAP. Uh, UMAP? It's for, yeah. <clears throat> it's for dimensional to reduction, UMAP Python. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's usually used for, like, very large data sets to, uh, to project them to 2D so that you can visualize them. Right. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. This one is a really useful package. Nice. So definitely people are trying to uh, project down to 2D. I mean, that's one of the problems, right? Is you've, how yeah. do you look at some of this stuff that's... Like 100 dimensional or 200 dimensions. <laughs> uh, you just can't visualize. I, I, I don't even have an, any idea at all how to do 100 dimensions. I remember in... We were doing some work with like complex analysis and you know two dimensional, but each dimension was complex numbers. So four dimensional that that was a challenge. I have yeah, yeah. no idea how to approach a hundred. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You, no one does. That's why these kind of dimensional reduction techniques exist. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah. of course, important in machine learning and stuff, right? There's like dimensions that you can just throw away because they don't actually contribute to the predictions and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humap does that exact excellently. Super. All right, Bex, thank you for being here. Final call thank to action. You, People want to get deeper in pandas, maybe learn more about some of your articles. You know, what do you tell them? Uh, well, um, as I said, just first check the documentation. 
you know, uh, the documentation is usually, it should be your first choice. Uh, it's, it's the best place to learn about a library. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it takes a little dedication, but go through it yeah. and find out what it has to offer and go from yeah. there. Right. Yeah. It's a bit hard to read, but, uh, documentation is always, uh, like gives the best, uh, information about the, uh, about the library because it's written by the package creators. So they, they know their library the best. Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for writing the article and sharing Thanks it for with having us. Me. Yeah, you. you bet. Bye.